Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our series on work-life balance. We are so excited to have you with us. We have a very exciting evening planned. My name is Francisca and I'm the head of the PeteSoc Mentorship Program. Before we kick off the events, I would just like to give everyone a brief overview of the agenda for the evening. We will start off um, with some reflection uh, on the current standing of our work-life balance. Thereafter, we will meet our amazing guest speaker, whom I will introduce in a little while. After this, we will take any questions for our guest speaker, if there are any at this stage. Um, then we will move on to the next section where we will look at our new enrichment portfolio. I will give an overview of the essence of the portfolio and Naledi, our enrichment mentor, will tell us a bit more about herself and the program. After this, we will take any additional questions if there are any. Then I would just like to mention that if throughout the talk you have any questions, please post them in the chat box or you could just unmute yourself and ask away. Um, if you would prefer to ask your questions anonymously, please direct them to Tiara Govinda, one of our mentors, who will be monitoring the chat box. Um, you can select the option to send the message only to her and then she will ask on your behalf. Um, then I would just also like to remind everyone that the event is being recorded um, so that we can um, share this video with those that can't attend um, tonight. With that being said, let's kick off the event with some reflection. Um, so I would like each of you to think briefly about the different categories of things that are seen in the table. And then consider the amount of time that you spend on each of these categories. You can divide different activities in your life into these categories as you see fit. For example, under academic, you could put schoolwork. Under social, you can include any activities that you do with friends or family. Spiritual might include um, any religious commitments or other spiritual com commitments. Um, and self-care may include anything from exercise or any activities that help you to relax or anything that you really see fit under self-care. Um, Basically, just adapt this table to your own life. Um, so then I would like you to look at the first two rows of this table under each of the categories. Then you can um, you can then fill in the ideal amount of time that you would like to spend on each of these categories per week um, or per month or per day or however you see fit. Um, and then under the current time spent, you can um, put in how much time you actually do spend on those activities currently. Then we can leave the last um, row for um, later on in the talk when we reflect back um, on what we've learned. Um, so then just to keep in mind, when we fill in this table, try to be as realistic as possible and adapt it to your own abilities and struggles. Also try to not compare yourself to others um, in general in this process as this can become very toxic quite quickly. Um, and then if ever you feel like you've lost balance, um, try to reach out for help to us or to anyone that you trust, um, as there's often someone that is going through something similar and they might, might be able to help you or to point you in the right direction. Um, so I'll give a little while for us to reflect on this and just fill in the first two rows in your own time and your own space. Um, so I'll just give a few moments for that. Okay, hopefully everyone's had a chance to fill this in. Oops. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Chloe Ile, who will hopefully be able to guide us a bit better on this topic. Um, Dr. Chloe Ile is a medical doctor who holds an MBCHB from the University of Cape Town, as well as an MSc in Global Health Policy from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She currently works as a lecturer for an HIV and CV management course run by the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and UCT. She also works as a medical writer for a consulting agency 
as well as keeps up with her medical practice as a locum GP. She's passionate about public health and research in Africa. Taking all of this into consideration, I think Dr. Ile is the perfect person to tell us a bit more about work-life balance. Welcome, Dr. Ile, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Over to you. Okay, hi, everybody. Thank you for that warm welcome, Francisca. Can you, I uh, just wanted to make sure my mic is working, you can see me and everything is fine. Yes. Um, okay, great. Uh, so yes, thank you for that very warm welcome. As she has mentioned, those are the things that are keeping me busy at the moment. And I was asked uh, very kindly to prepare a presentation on work-life balance and basically what it means for me and what it means for those of us in the profession and how we can go about trying to achieve it. So yeah, I prepared a short presentation. I'll just share my screen um, for us to go through and discuss work-life balance. Okay, just want to, let me just confirm, you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So let's start. Okay, so the topic as we've uh, been told today is, is the importance of work-life balance. Um, at present, um, yes, you are still in med school, whichever year you are, but hopefully you will learn some tools here that you can use and carry with you, especially throughout your early years of working. Okay, so firstly, just to recap on the issue of mental health um, conditions and why mental health awareness is important. So the South African Depression and Anxiety Group um, has said that depression, anxiety, grief, and trauma have been on the increase in South Africa. And this is as of July 2021. And it's most likely it coinc um, coincides with the pandemic and all the stresses that have been occurring um, in many people's lives around the country. Um, they have stated that one in three South Africans either currently do suffer from a mental illness or they will suffer from mental illness in their lifetime, which is extremely high if you think about it. If you take any three people, one of those people either currently does have a mental condition or will suffer from a mental condition. And then also, um, considering the context we're in, South Africa is an upper middle income country. Um, so there are a fair amount of resources, but obviously not as much as high income countries. And that reflects in how we um, are able to provide healthcare to South Africans. So due to that access to uh, access to and resource, resources for mental health care remain limited for most South Africans. So when we look spe specifically at the states of mental health awareness in the healthcare profession, the WHO has um, stated very clearly that in the health professional, one of the key problems apart from um, other mental health conditions like anxiety, like depression, like substance abuse, also includes burnout. And this is defined as a syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been managed successfully. It is characterized by three dimensions. So feelings of low energy or exhaustion, increased mental distance from your job or negativism towards your job, as well as reduced personal efficacy. Um, so for yourselves, um, even now within uh, while you are studying and when you start working, just keep this in mind, um, especially regarding burnout. The workload is very high and um, during your internship and community service years, you don't really have a choice as to the number of patients you will have to see and it will be a shock to the system and it may affect your mental health. So just keep in mind if you feel that your energy is abnormal, abnormally low, um, you feel distant from your job, not engaged, sort of depersonalized, or you feel that you're not as efficient or um, effective in your job, then just consider that uh, you may need to seek help for burnout. So now coming to the topic at hand, which is work-life balance, we just we first need to discuss what it is so we have an understanding of what we're dealing with. So the Cambridge Dictionary defines work-life balance as the amount of time you spend doing your job compared to the amount of time you spend with your family and doing the things you enjoy. So in essence, it's a balance or of two aspects of your life. So, well, not really two aspects. Work is 
grouped as one sort of aspect and the rest of your life is grouped as another aspect. And that in itself can tell you um, some things about the definition of work-life balance that maybe can get you thinking about how work-life balance can be managed. Okay. So as a healthcare professional, there are certain challenges with uh, achieving work-life balance, and this can be due to our increased workloads, um, long hours, um, not really having weekends a lot of the time, um, and bringing home stress from work. Um, it can, that sort of mental occupation also reduces from your ability to fully be present in your non-work related activities. So that is how we should think about work-life balance and possible problems that may arise when work-life balance is not well managed in healthcare professionals. Okay, so to sort of familiarize myself with the topic and um, yeah, just get an understanding of what the thoughts are around work-life balance, I went to YouTube as we do for many things and I just typed in work-life balance and I looked at what the three highest um, viewed videos were in relation to these. So the first was a video by School of Life um, about work-life balance. And you can see it had 735,000 views. The second was by a lady, Dr. Michelle Ryan. She's an organizational psychologist in the United Kingdom, and hers had 215,000 views. And the third was by Jeff Bezos, who is the founder and ex CEO of Amazon. So, just to summarize what um, the messages were from these to save time, um, We'll start with School of Life. So in School of Life, the, the idea that they discussed was that achieving work-life balance is a beautiful dream, um, which is a bit shocking and disheartening. It's not quite what you expect when you click on the video. Um, they say that it is impossible and we should realize this without bitterness or frustration. Uh, what the video also speaks to is that um, much of our life involves generalization. And what they mean by that is that we compartmentalize part of our brains to attend to different things. So you sort of have work mode, you have home mode, you have family mode, all of those sort of things. So it's not really about a balance, it's more a, a multitasking sort of idea that they speak to. Um, the second video by Dr. Michelle Ryan, uh, her research mostly involves work-life balance um, as it pertains to women. She looks at what women have done and why they are seen or viewed as differently in the workforce. And um, this is quite relevant even to this day and age 2021 because uh, a lot of women make career choices and professional choices based on what they feel they need to achieve that work and family sort of balance. And that's how she speaks to work-life balance. Um, and in her video, she says that work-life balance is not just about time. Um, in most cases, it's, it's found to center around individuals' perceptions of identity and belonging. Um, so she gives the example of women in healthcare, right? So she had done a study where they looked at, they asked a number of residents, um, I think it was in the UK, where, where, uh, that were planning to become surgeons. They interviewed them in their first year and so, okay, these are the number of women who are keen on moving forward with surgery as their area of specialization. And then they came back to the same group it, towards the end of their residency in their third or fourth years and asked them the same questions as in, do you still feel comfortable? Are you still passionate about pursuing this, this path? And uh, the findings were that women, um, I think about 45% women had changed their perceptions to um, their change their answers from the original answers they'd given in that first year. And most of the time, the changes were cited to be due to concerns around, you know, having time for their families. Many women wanted to have um, children and that sort of issue. Um, and another issue that she found came up um, was around how comfortable these women were in their settings. So there are still certain professional areas that are male dominated. Um, and it's not that women cannot do that, um, do not have that skill or do not have that ability. Uh, it was more that they felt that they did not see themselves advancing in that career field because they did not see other people like them there. 
as much as in other fields. So when you talk about mental acuity or um, just general other skills that you, uh, dexterity, other things you would need to be a successful surgeon, women do have those skills. Um, however, it was the consideration that there are fewer women they have seen be successful in this field. Um, so it's not really an issue of lack of skills, not even an issue of time, because if you look at nurses, that is a predominantly female dominated area. And these women work long hours, for example, in midwifery um, at crazy hours. And um, there's no concern around that, um, around their efforts there. So she says that identity and perceptions of belonging play a big role in what we choose to do in terms of our, our career. And then the third was Jeff Bezos. And um, he very adamantly from the beginning of the video says that, no, he doesn't believe in work-life balance. He doesn't like the term. Um, he doesn't believe that the, um, the number of hours play any role in the balance that you perceive to have in your life. Um, he likes to describe it as work-life harmony. And um, he's more focused on where you spend your energy. So he says that he himself, he doesn't spend, he claims to not spend uh, exorbitant amount of amounts of time at work or at the office. Yes, he does his work and he works hard, but he makes sure that he also has time to down for himself as sort of downtime um, so that he can, you know, sort of direct his energies appropriately at work. He's enthusiastic. He's fully present at home. He's also enthusiastic. He's fully present. So those are some of the ideas that came from the top three most viewed videos. And um, if you look at all three, um, I found there was an interesting thread across the three, which is the first being that work-life balance as we know it may in fact be a myth. It may not be what we think it to be. Um, so that is something we will explore a bit further just now. And that the, the second thing is our sense of identity and belonging does play a, a big sense in whether we, we feel we can have work-life balance as well as the career setting that we are in. Um, so those are things that we should consider, and I'll speak more to those as we move forward. Okay. All right, so um, I looked around to see what can we use as a template for how we go about achieving work-life balance. So I found one very useful article. It was published in the Journal of Oncology Practice, um, where they discussed uh, work-life balance amongst early career healthcare professionals. And there were five main key points that you see here. Those were the ones that they thought that were important for achieving work-life balance. So we'll discuss each of these in detail. Um, but in addition to these, I've also spoken to a few colleagues and friends just to see what are their thoughts, you know, what are their ex experiences from internship community service? What did, how did they find it? And now that they're at this stage, you know, past uh, being at the mercy of the government, so to speak, what um, have they learned? Okay. So let's go to number one. Uh, so the first thing that came up when I spoke to my friends and also in this article is set priorities. So you need to decide what is important to you and the kind of life that you want to live. So in med school, while you're still studying, you may have a vague idea of what it is. You know, you have that dream, that image of, you know, what you would like to be doing. I know I have mine. Um, so just hold on to that. And then as you progress throughout your career, remember to keep checking in with yourself to see whether you're on the path that you had imagined for yourself. And if not, if the path you're taking is different, whether it's still something you're at peace with. Um, so one of my uh, friends, Dr. Vanessa Rumambora, she had this to say. She said, take time to learn yourself. Take time to learn about your personality. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? What energizes you? And then use that knowledge to fill up your tank when it's empty. Um, and this is so true. Um, so I, for example, with myself, I'm an introvert. Uh, I do like to be social, but I really also do like to spend my time on my own. Um, as well. And that I find re-energizes me. So when, um, for example, you've had a busy day at OPD, you've seen 40 patients or whatever, and you're just completely drained. I really just, I come home, 
in complete silence, sit on the couch for like an hour, a cup of tea, just do what you have to do to sort of reset yourself before you go on with the rest of your day so that you are able to, to some degree, leave work behind and engage with your family, your friends, and the duties and responsibilities you have outside of work. Um, so yeah, that's just number one, setting your priorities, knowing what it is you want for yourself out of life and how you can merge your career or integrate your career into that plan. And then number two is saying no. And um, what this article discusses is that early in their career, they're speaking to the to the residents that had been interviewed. Um, you may not appreciate that you have the that you can say no. So recognize that your skill set is highly valued and that you are in the driver's seat and be true to your priorities. So saying no is an interesting one. Uh, um, I, I believe it to be true, um, although not easy. So I'll uh, give you an example of a story when I was in my first year of internship. It was my first rotation of Um I, I had a consultant who hated me. That man hated me. I don't know what I did to him, but he really didn't like me. Anyways, there was one sometime during the, the course of that rotation, it's four months, um, I had swapped a call with another intern in my group because she had something, some other commitment. So I was like, cool, it's fine, we swapped. Um, and then, yeah, she had done the call that I was supposed to be on. And then the morning came when I was supposed to do her call. No, no, it's the other way around, sorry. I had done the call that she was supposed to be on. And the morning came when she was supposed to do my call. And then we were at our morning meetings and... Um, the consultant asked, who's the MO on call? This person says, I'm on call. Who's the intern on call? And then um, the according to the roster, it still had her name. We had not changed it on the roster. So uh, the consultant, he was extremely unhappy. He was like, uh, you guys can't swap for that kind of thing. Um, I said, I, I did her call literally two days ago. Um, I didn't think it was an issue. She agreed to do mine because she has this thing going on. Sort of thing but he he was not happy he said in front of everyone who's actually shouting he was like no you have to do the call i'm your boss i'm telling you to do the call blah 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 so i was like okay i obviously was not prepared for a call on that day i was so shaken up at the, <laughs> during that meeting and at the end of it but hey went through the day at the end of the day you know went changed into scrubs came back ready for the call and i could see that the medical officer that i was on duty with she felt bad because she could tell that you know the situation was not quite fair um yes indeed the other girl had done the call on the day that i was supposed to and we had swapped like that so i could see throughout the night she kept like telling me to go and take breaks and all of that but i was afraid of my consultant at the time because he still had to sign my logbook um so i went ahead and did the full nights and everything, uh, reported everything at the morning meeting. And um, that was it. So I think there will be situations where you may feel disempowered and not necessarily feel like you have the ability to say no as an, you know, as a junior healthcare professional. Um, and using that example, if I think back now, would I have said no? Um, the way I know I felt and I saw things, probably not. There definitely is a power imbalance because at the end of the day, I still needed him to sign my, my logbook. But if you feel comfortable and confident enough to actually say no to your consultant for something that is blatantly unfair, then by all means, I would say that you do that as you know professionally as you can. You're not trying to start a screaming match. Um, but yeah, just make sure you state the facts and say no when you can say no. Um, of course, every day you show up and you do 100%, you know, try and take care of your patients. Uh, beyond that, make sure that you do not take on more work than you have to uh, for the sake of, you know, proving a point because at the end of the day, you will wear yourself down. Okay. And then the third point uh, speaks to time versus money. So this is not really um, doing your internship and community service years across the different health professionals health professions, um, you don't have so much choice in terms of where you work and how you work and all of those sort of things. It's really uh, once you're done with community service uh, and you're now an independent you know, practitioner or in whatever field you're in, it's very exciting. Um, and then you now have to decide, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to structure my life? 
And a trend I've seen is that many people take on a lot of work. Um, so we already know the healthcare profession is demanding. So seeing patients and then they take on very, um, they take on additional sort of shifts on top of that uh, to earn money. And of course, everyone's financial situation is different. But what I notice is that uh, these people, I find them to be more unhappy and slightly more bitter in medicine. Um, and I think that's just something to be cognizant of when you, as you grow throughout your career. Um, yes, money is very nice and it's very important. Um, but you have to consider, okay, am I taking care of my physical health, my mental health, attending to things outside of work? Um, work is important. It's a crucial part of life, but it's not everything. So we have to just remember that as well as you proceed through your career. And then um, the fourth point spoke to avoiding cynicism. Um, so here they say that in addition to the emotional loss that physicians experience with the death and suffering of patients, other emotions can emerge, including a sense of failure, feelings of powerlessness, and a desire to avoid patients to escape these feelings. And um, once again, this is something that I have seen, um, both as an, you know, as an intern in the ComServe and post uh, ComServe, I have seen and met bitter MOs and um, not everyone, there are many kind and caring uh, people in, health, in the health profession, but uh, for some people it does take a toll and it's sort of you sort of lose that human essence that thing that makes us human that caring sort of nature or streak um, so I'll give you an example it was during my community service year and I was working in the military at a sick bay and it was a Sunday I was on call um, so the way it works is you're sort of on call for the whole weekend but you don't see necessarily every patient that's called out. There are professional nurse, nurses as well who attended to some of the patients. Um, so I got a call. There's an emergency. It's a red case. Um, we have a resus. OK, cool. I lived in basically DQ, uh, which was two minutes away down the street. I jumped in my car, drove down, got to the place, started this um, resus on this patient. Um, took five hours. Unfortunately, the patient demised. Um, at the end of it, I was speaking to one of the nurses and she said that um, a colleague of mine and another, he was a senior MO, um, he had actually been at the facility, I think, to fetch something or something else. At the time that this patient came, while the nurses were triaging and it was a red case and they were frantically running around and apparently he just walked away. He turned around and walked away, drove out of his car, didn't think to maybe, you know, initiate resource because the earlier it's done, um, the the better the outcomes are for the patient. So I'm not saying it was his responsibility, but um, it's that sort of humanist to remember that we are in the business of trying to care for people and save lives when necessary. Um, so yeah, I thought that was just an example of a very sort of cold response, um, probably over years of maybe he was treated unfairly sort of thing as well. Um, yeah, so it's important to remember that we are in a caring profession. If you feel that you're not able to, you don't have that capacity to care anymore, then as you need, take a step back and consider your options. Maybe you just need a break or maybe you need a change. Consider all of that. Um, but you don't want to be that healthcare professional who is unkind to patients because patients come to you when they're most vulnerable, especially in the public sector. And then the last point was about making it happen, or I would put in brackets before that, trying to make it happen. And um, just remember that this is not a perfect process. You may not necessarily get the balance right on the first try, um, but it's as long as you have it in your mind continuously at the back of your mind that this is something you want to, to achieve. You want to have time for other things in your life outside of just your work um, to, to feel sort of as a more I feel like a uh, more whole person, um, then yeah, it's something that you need to work out continuously. So remember to create time for personal reflection, you know, exercise, keep chatting with your friends and family, uh, do things that interest you outside of your workplace and um, consider hobbies and other things like that. And a quote from one of my friends is, it's not a very easy thing to do because it's an extremely busy, inherently busy and consuming profession. 
but don't think that small things are not important, like exchanging voice notes with a friend during the day. I found these took my mind off stress and made me feel refreshed and energized. So yeah, those are the five points. I'll just go back, set priorities, um, say no professionally when you can. Um, when you start working, remember it's not all about money. Um, try not to be a cynical healthcare profession, professional. Um, if you feel yourself becoming cold, try and do what you need to do to address that and then make it happen. Remember that it's something you have to be intention intentional about and it will require you know, continuous effort uh, while you're in this career. And yeah, I think that is the message I have today on work-life balance. Um, and I hope that you learned some points from here that were that are helpful to you. Okay, I think we'll. If there are any questions, we'll take some now. I'll just hand over to um, Francisca. Thank you so much for these insights, Dr. Ile. I definitely feel like you raised some very valid points and things that we just needed to be reminded of and. Um, yeah, just to reflect on again, and for me personally, this really helped me, and I trust that everyone else um, is also um, feeling the same way. Um, but yeah, if anyone does have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself, um, or if there's anything in the chat box, I don't see anything in the chat box. Um, so yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself if you do want to ask Dr. Ile something. I see we are getting some reactions from <laughs> the participants, which seems positive. Hi, <laughs> I have a question. Um, my name is Asha, I'm a final year student, so really close to internship. But I have a question with how do you deal with um, some of the harsh things seniors say, like in the work life and not letting it affect you. Like I know people always say you must let it what that what that's saying about letting it just go pass your back or something like that. But mm -hmm. like you shouldn't take it personally, but it's difficult though. Because in the times, especially now when you're trying to study and you think about these things, it's very discouraging. Like how do you get over that? <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. Um you are very right. You do have seniors will, who will have unkind words. Um, sometimes it seems unfounded. Um, so yeah, I think in my experience, um, it's something that I've sort of grown stronger in. Um, I remember not so much in med school, but as an intern, you know, when you encounter those sort of mean um, seniors, um, it, it would really affect me. And sometimes I would talk to my mom about it and I'm really like really low. Um, but as I've sort of grown in the profession, I, I've learned that, um, as they mentioned in the article um, as well, that you are highly skilled and you are valuable and you do have something to bring. So don't ever let that, um, don't ever forget that fact. Um, and yeah, in all cases, as long as you're trying your best, we are not perfect. There will be some things that you may not know, but you, you can learn and you will learn. And um, yeah, so I think it's just a matter of realizing that firstly, uh, some people are more mean than they should be or need to be. And secondly, that you, you have inherent value and worth and you are skilled and you are where you should be. There's a reason you are there. So, so yeah, it's definitely something that takes time, but you know, sometimes more comments, some comments may, may hurt you more than others, but with time you, you do learn how to deal with them. Yeah. Thank you. I can't wait till I reach that point. <laughs> if I could Don't worry, it'll be, it'll be fine. Any um, other questions? Question. Dr. Ile, this is Christine. Um, my question is just, if you could tell yourself looking back to kind of get you through inter internship, something that you learned during your time there, what would that be? Okay, thank you, Christine. <laughs> Christine is my sister. <laughs> I actually didn't know you, it was you at first. You sounded different. 
Um, okay, so what would I have done or what could I have done differently? Okay, looking back for as advice for those going through who will be going through internship, I would say make sure that um, you have your uh, support systems or try and create one wherever you are. So, for example, I was my family's here in Cape Town. I ended up doing internship in Free State. I was there for two years. And literally, I think it was my friendships that I created there. And um, also keeping myself busy, as in finding what you can do in your free time um, as far as possible that engages you and that makes you feel good. I would say those are two key tips to remember going into a space where you're not too sure. And yeah, those would definitely help me during my community service year. Um, you know, I had learned, you know, keep uh, as isolated as you may be or feel uh, as removed as you may feel from everyone, you know, try and keep in contact with your loved ones and make sure you keep doing activities that you enjoy. Self-care, um, although self-care is not always about the nice things. Yes, it's nice to sleep as much as you want and indulge in whatever you want to eat. But, you know, exercise, it really does help. Um, yeah, just try and take care of yourself overall. So those would be the things I would say. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Ile, once again. Um, yeah, we really appreciate um, you sharing all of these with us. Um, now we will just move. Oh, someone has raised their hand. I uh, I just wanted to ask Dr. Flo. Okay, yeah. So Ile, actually, I just wanted you know to know what is the hardest part you know about of being a clinician. I would say you know of helping people. What's the hardest part, you know, in the workplace? Um, thank you for your question. Um, the hardest part, I would say there are, there are a few challenges. Um, the first is related to obviously the people that you're trying to help your patients. Uh, sometimes patients may come in, uh, especially in the public sector, quite critical because um, social challenges, they haven't been able to get to a healthcare facility before. So the stress of having this really sick patient in front of you is in, it, in itself challenging. So that is one challenge. But um, with your training, you do learn how to deal and, you know, attend to that person as efficiently as possible. The second thing is um, colleagues, certain colleagues can make uh, your time sort of or, or the work day more difficult. You do get, um, especially in internship and concert, these may be things you encounter where you have lazy seniors who just, you know, are not present. Um, you have no sort of guidance, especially in those years when you don't know what's going on um, and sort of dump their work on you. You're doing full ward rounds on your own. Um, that is not impossible. So yeah, that um, that is another challenging aspect. Uh, but in that case, I would say as far as possible, really uh, lean on your fellow interns or comserves, um, and that can make the experience more pleasant. Um, so those would be the two main challenges. And I think the third one would probably just be relating to, you know, um, the changes that you encounter. So for example, if you're in a new province or uh, away from your family or something like that um, and at the same time you're sort of balancing that newfound independence of earning for the first time a proper salary and um, all the responsibilities you have that go with it um, so yeah those are a few of the challenges um, so you know difficult or complicated patients um, you know, workplace politics that can definitely get to you and then um, just the environmental change as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I I just always thought that you know most of doctors and uh, surgeons and stuff they they would their greatest challenge. I I always thought that you know it would be uh, 
the fact that, you know, it's not always the case that, you know, you save it. Yeah, something like that. So I never really thought about, you know, ever then, yeah, and we have your colleagues and I now realize that, you know, actually even the environment and yeah, the people you interact with, yeah. They are part of the challenges that we will encounter. Oh. Yeah, definitely. Um, what you're saying about losing patience is very true and it is very hard. Um, yeah, I mean, in in med school, you do have a bit of that exposure, you know, some of your patients that you care for during your rotations, internal medicine, so forth, internal uh, EC uh, may pass away. But it's different when you are sort of their doctor and you got to know this patient a bit and then they pass away. Um, so yeah, that is part of the difficulty as well, I'd say, managing, you know, very sick, complicated patients. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thank you, Dr. Ile. Um, I think we will move on to the next section. Um, so next, we will look at our about our enrichment mentorship portfolio. Just going to share my screen again. Okay, so um, our enrichment mentorship portfolio we specifically started within the mentorship program this year. Um, to help our students to have a better work-life balance or to try to help them to have a better work-life balance. The aim of this portfolio is to inform our mentors and mentees about various different activities, events, societies, um, places to visit and groups, groups to be part of at UCT and in the greater Cape Town area. Um, we started off this initiative by compiling information on the different interests of our mentees via Google Form. Um, we then use this information to guide us as to which activities to focus on, specifically for our mentees and mentors. One of our student mentors, Naledi Ngema, is a student on Upper Campus and she's ideally suited um, to head this um, new portfolio. She um, will be sending regular newsletters that inform the students about um, what I've mentioned um, and things that are happening around UCT and Cape Town. With that, I'm going to hand over to Naledi to tell us a bit more about this. Over to you, Naledi. Okay, cool. Okay, just to make sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Naledi. I'm doing my final year of undergraduate studies, triple majoring in psychology, gender, and linguistics. You're probably thinking, and no, I'm not reading your mind because I study psychology, but you're probably thinking, why am I here? Well, academics can get quite stressful and time consuming that you don't even get time to engage with yourself and fall in love with all the beauties of life that you would really get from eight hours of studying or that last minute rush to class. This is exactly where I come in. The Pediatric Society is meant to guide not only academic lifestyle, but all the other things that make you human. And that is where the enrichment portfolio, which I'm responsible for, is meant to bridge the gap in between these two amazing aspects that make you um, the potential professional that you're going to be. The main goal of this portfolio is to provide you with all the things you, from beautiful spaces in and around Cape Town that remind you of your favorite adventure series, to exotic restaurants that give you a taste of home, or maybe even your desired um, holiday destination. Hiking spots, aquariums, volunteer work, ice skating places, and who knows, you might slip into new friendships. This um, enrichment portfolio is for you, by you, because all the newsletters that will be released via email monthly are based on places and experiences that you said you're interested in. In the first newsletter, I'll also provide a link to a website that gives, that gives discounts for spa treatments, beauty, restaurants, holiday getaways, and many more fun things because as students, we all want to have an amazing time without spending much. Thank you so much for your time and I cannot wait to share all these places with you and please feel free to email me if you have any further questions or we can address them here. Thank you. Thank you, Naledi. Um, you've done really, you've really done a great job with this. Um, does anyone have any questions about the enrichment portfolio? Um, 
we will be sending out the first net newsletter soon that Naledi has been working very hard on. Um, so thank you for that. Um, but any questions at the moment? Okay, cool. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Naledi, you can just contact me on one of the mentorship WhatsApp groups and I will give you her contact details. Um, and she will also be in contact with you um, via her next newsletter that you will be receiving soon. Thank you, Naledi. Okay, um, so just a bit more on this portfolio um, and the hike that we have planned for this weekend. Um, so when we looked at the interests of our mentees, one of the most popular activities mentioned was spending time outdoors or hiking, which is exactly why we have planned a hike for you guys this weekend. The hike will be at the Lion's Head Contour Path on Sunday 29 August at 8 a.m. Um, please note that we have moved this from the Saturday due to um, predicted rain on the Saturday. Um, this, uh, the concert path is not the usual route people take to get to um, Lion's Head. It is a bit less strenuous, but still offers amazing views and is also a bit more inclusive to different levels of fitness. Um, I have sent a Google form um, that you can fill in if you are interested in joining us for the hike. I have sent this on the WhatsApp groups, um, but please try to um, fill in this form early so that you don't um, miss out on this opportunity as we do have limited spaces. Um, then I just also need to mention that we do still need to comply with all um, COVID protocols. So everyone on the hike must wear their mask throughout the hike and um, in whichever transport um, we are providing for you. Um, and then yeah, just regular sanitizing um, and so forth. Um, then we are also going to be providing some snacks um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Um, if you do have any questions about this, please feel free to WhatsApp me or to um, send us an email at uctpsoc.mentorship at gmail.com. Okay, um, so just before we end, I would like to encourage everyone to do a last bit of reflection um, that links to the reflection that we did in the beginning. Um, so in your own time um, after the meeting, you can just think about what we've discussed in this meeting and what your goals are for your um, work-life balance. And then just in the last row in the table, you can fill in the goal amounts of time or amounts of energy um, or whatever you would, that you would like to spend on each of the different categories in your life. And obviously you can adapt this as necessary. Um, but yeah, um, then just before we end, I would just like to ask if anyone has any questions for Dr. Ile, uh, for myself, or for Na Lady. Okay, um, seeing as no one has any questions, um, I would just like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, we loved having you and spending some time with you. Um, then I would also like to extend a very special thank you to Dr. Ile for sharing some very valuable insights um, with us today. We definitely learned a lot, or I definitely did, um, and I, I'm sure everyone else did as well. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Ile. Um, then I would also just like to say thank you to um, our mentors, Naledi, uh, for preparing such excellent content um, for uh, the enrichment portfolio and for the upcoming newsletter. Um, thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.